going to sell in the bookstore? How do we get into the bookstores? How do we make it sell there? That makes no sense today when that's a shrinking market and a minority market. Now, just to be clear, he's not saying the book publishing is going to stop or reading is going to stop. He's just saying that, wake up, it's 2020, we live in a different world. For one thing, once upon a time, there were maybe half a million titles to choose from at any given time. Now there are about 18 million possible books people could buy, something like 40 times what there were a few decades ago. You might find all of those at Amazon. You're not going to find them all anywhere else. Bookstores, even the big ones, can carry maybe 35,000 titles, not even close to all of them. In that respect, they cannot compete with online booksellers. And as a result, publishers that could usually expect at least some small profit or loss on a book can't expect that anymore. It's harder than it ever was before to make money publishing a book. And so they, like Zando, are looking at new ways of selling books because that's the only way they're going to stay alive. Particularly focusing on direct sales. In other words, circumventing the bookstore and selling directly to customers online through their websites compiling email lists of book customers, soliciting them with spam email, working the internet to come up with new ways of selling books. That is something that I don't think we're going to see reverse just because the coronavirus lockdown ends. That's just going to be the way of the world. Less emphasis on New York, less emphasis on bookstores, which could create opportunities for the savvy Red Sneaker Writer. One last story. I had to end with this. I know I've talked before about young writers, but this is such a wonderful story I had to share. There's a new claimant to the title of Britain's youngest ever published author, and that's a six-year-old named Heath Grace, who has written a book on how to handle an autistic mum. He lives in Cornwall with his mom and a three-month-old brother. The book that he wrote and illustrated when he was five is called My Mummy is Autistic. And in the book, he explains what it's like living with a parent who has autism with surprising insight and clarity. And like I said, illustrations so other kids can get it. Here's a quote from the text that accompanies the drawings. He wrote, if I say lots of words, they get stuck in a queue in Mummy's brain, and I have a long wait until she hears me. But apparently he's learned to live with it. His mom, Joanna Grace, says, quote, I am always very proud of Heath, and of course I'm proud of this, but more astonished as I never imagined it would get published. End quote. Do you hear what I'm saying? Nobody can predict what's going to get published or what's going to sell well or what's going to be the next two million dollar book sale with any degree of accuracy. The only thing I can say for sure is that it's not going to happen to you if you're not in the game. How do you get in the game? By writing every day, doing the best work you can and putting it out there. Ask yourself right now, do you have a story like Heath Grace's story, something nobody ever thought could be the subject of the book, but then again, it's unique and it's interesting and it hasn't been done, something that perhaps no one, like Joanna Grace, ever imagined could be a wonderful book. And they won't until you write it. What's your story? <music> Laura Bernhardt, author of The Wantland Files and many other wonderful books. How are you holding up with no electricity? Oof. Um, this has not been the best week ever, but um, what can you do? You, you <laughs> adapt and you just kind of keep moving. And um, the we sun's did. out today, so we have a little bit of light. Candlelight is not the best thing 
to get ready for work by or uh, to write by <laughs> or really to do anything by. Yeah, it just you could give up shaving and uh, <laughs> and we did at least have hot water. Yes, yes. Anyway, hey. um, at WriterCon, I remember Mary Anna Evans gave a couple talks. The point of being, make your readers feel something. When you make them feel something, that's when you have a hit. And that's something you do really well. So oh, would you, you talk thank for you. a minute about how to get that kind of emotional response from readers? Sure. I appreciate that. I, I have received uh, some feedback along those lines in reviews of my books. People will talk about how much they were moved by some of my books. And when they say they're moved by it, it's exactly what you're talking about. You've made them feel something. You are tapping into their emotions. And I do believe 100% that the best reads are the ones that reach deep inside you and grab hold of your heart and uh, make you feel something very strongly. I do bring that into uh, the Supernatural Suspense series, The Wantland Files, that you mentioned. I have things, uh, so subplots, if you will, uh, that the protagonist deals with. Um, there are things going on from her past that she's trying to sort out, um, as well as the emotional connections that she feels with the people in her crew and people that are around her. And, and a little bit of uh, romantic chemistry starting to sizzle between her and Sterling. So there are lots of ways to bring an emotional element into your books. Uh, it can be a romantic thread. Everybody enjoys having a little bit of romance there and making the heartbeat pat a little bit. You can also bring, uh, like I do in the Supernatural Suspense series, you know, a little bit of pulse pounding scariness. Something isn't quite right. Something's going on that isn't isn't normal, isn't natural, the supernatural. And that's something that uh, will keep those readers turning pages because it's a little bit scary and you're, you're sending a chill down the spine. And then, of course, you can explore friendships. Uh, it's, it's a matter of finding an emotional resonance that everyone can connect with, or at least a lot of people can connect with, Sure, no one's going to, not everyone will connect with every single thing that you write. And then, of course, in women's fiction, those are primarily emotionally based. There's a lot of introspection, a lot of working through pain from experiences that we've been through or um, coping with maybe emotional scars, trying to overcome something that has gone horribly wrong, that the protagonist is really having trouble healing from. So in the in the women's fiction, a lot of times that resolution is really going to be a healing of sorts where she's managed to uh, overcome and is feeling better and, and is in a better place than where she started in the book. And I think when that's successfully done, that is absolutely the best and most satisfying read when you close the cover or you, you close the cover of your reading device and you you feel good because you got that little bit of resolution with them. And and maybe it even helps you work through some of your own past grief or pain or problems. So it, it can be therapeutic or it can be kind of an entertaining um, emotional roller coaster. Um, but it's it's incredibly important to bring those elements into the book. Otherwise, I think it's just a flat read. That's terrific advice. Thanks for offering your writing tips, Laura. Thank you for having me, Bill. As I mentioned earlier, my interview this time is with David Gogrin. You've probably guessed by now that this was recorded in advance. Thank goodness. But I'm glad to have it available. And who better to help us know what to do? There are so many options out there for book marketing, but this is the guy who knows what works. Let's hear what David had to say. David, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me back, Bill. Hey, I've been telling people, and I'm not just saying this because you're on 
on on the show this time. I've been telling people for years who are interested in publishing or self-publishing the textbook. The book you need to get is David Gogren's Let's Get Digital. That's like the Uber test, the Ur text, whatever, you know what I mean. You're coming out with a new edition of it, right? Yeah, it's actually it's actually already out. And the, the cool thing is um, I launched it as a perma-free book. So um, the ebook edition, at least, is available for free on any retailer where you where you buy ebooks, and it's bang up to date. Um, I rewrote probably about two thirds of the book or more, um, just to update it uh, and make sure that everything was you know bang up to date for twenty twenty. All the latest best practices on mm-hmm. finding cover designers and editors and wrestling with things like metadata and things like that, and marketing, of course, the biggest the biggest problem of all that all authors have to solve. Right. So now I can tell people this is not only the best book, it's free, which makes it even more. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> the best, the cheapest and the newest, which is a pretty good combo. At least for a while, it's the newest. Some, I'm sure next week someone will have one and so grab what, that title off me. What has changed most or what are the things you had to revise in the world of digital publishing? You know what, for this, for this edition, um, it wasn't so much that I had to change the information. It was actually more about the way I was presenting the information because I had to, I had to recognize that the, my ideal reader, my average customer has changed a little bit over the last 10 years that I've been releasing different, different editions of this book. And when I released the first edition way back in the digital stone ages of 2011, um, back then you had to really kind of convince people that that self publishing was a viable option. And I think half the book or two thirds of the book was given over to actually convincing people that self publishing was no longer the last refuge of the scoundrel. And yes, it was possible to build an audience and make money and it wouldn't damage your career and might actually do something good for you. And all those things that I think most people have generally accepted as true now in, in, in 2020. Um, but there was, there was a few things that I, that I, realize now with a bit more experience that people need more guidance on like i was very lucky when i started self-publishing in 2011 in that um my first cover designer was my sister and she actually worked for a big five publishing company so she was able to guide me through the process of you know kind of branding myself and and you know figuring out where you're shelved in the bookstore and that your book should look like the other books there. And, you know, you can stand out, but it's better to actually fit in than stand out and all these kind of things that she would have known professionally. And I was able to skip the step of making all those mistakes, but I realize now that authors need a bit more guidance there. So the chapter, for example, on cover design, isn't just about where to find a cover designer. It's also about how to brief your cover designer and actually spend more time talking about that kind of thing. And the process that you have to go through to make sure that you end up with a cover that's not just professional and not just look one that looks good, but one that attracts the right readers, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think a mistake that all of us probably make at some point over our career is that we jump on some nice cover that we see or we approve a design that we like, Mm -hmm. but it's not quite right for the audience. It's maybe attracting the wrong reader, kind of an adjacent audience, if you like. So I, I thought it was important in this edition to break down things like that. Uh, What kind of information you need to actually give your cover designer to make sure you get the exactly right cover for your niche and for your genre. Well, often when I'm talking to people being, especially being published for the first time, they like a cover because it's pretty, you know, because it's attractive, but not not necessarily the best selling cover, right? Right, and but look, you know, Pretty is good. You know, you want it to be interactive. You want it to look professional. You know, it is your, your book's face to the world. People do judge a book by a cover. Like that's, that cliche is the most inaccurate cliche of all time because people actually do. And we should judge a book by a cover. Um, so yeah, it is important. Um, but it's also important to remember what the exact role of a cover is, and especially an ebook cover in a digital world. And it's, it's important to always put yourself in the shoes of your reader and how they encounter your cover. Um, For example, when your cover designer is designing your book cover, they're often working with these, you know, these giant monitors that that graphic designers often have, which take up half the room, you know, and they can often create these beautiful, ornate, complex cover designs. And if they're not experienced um, in designing ebook covers specifically, they can sometimes go for a more subtle design that might look great on a six by nine paperback on a shelf, but it gets lost when you shrink it down to the kind of postage stamp size that most people will first encounter an ebook cover. And I think it's important to remember that 
you know, on your book page on Amazon or, or Barnes and Noble or wherever, there is a nice sized cover, but most people won't be going, most people who are new to you and are just discovering you won't be going straight to your website or won't be going straight to your books page on Amazon or Google or wherever. They're probably going to see it in like a deals email, like BookBub or 